this time, I would like to invite my esteemed CEO, Ms. Valerie Vieira, to bid you welcome for the afternoon. A very warm welcome from Team JBDC, Jamaica Business Development Corporation. And we're so happy that despite the rain, and the Jamaican people afraid of rain, right? So happy that you have decided to, yeah, to be with us this evening. And our panelists, one come clear from you know where, Portland. So I'm accustomed to the rain. So, Mr. Murray, my mandible connections and our accelerator. I think we're going to have a fabulous, informative afternoon. Now, most things I know about agriculture is evidence-based by, you know, the size of eating. But I think this evening we're going to get some technical information that should make us see things differently. And I was peeping on our information over there and realizing the great opportunities that exist for us in terms of relating the green economy, the blue economy, and how them clash. You know, you have music clash to see how we can benefit from them coming together and, and seeing how we can really eke out some opportunities. I'm a little biased for my MSMEs, so I'm hoping that I can discern where we can plug along, like with my accelerator, to see how we have those opportunities. I'm not going to be pretending that I know anything about the opportunities in detail, but we want discussion. We want questions. Despite Dr. Deslandis having a history of lecturing, I know that him up here for today. Him up there to share. So we want people to prepare questions and to really ask the questions and leave informed. So tonight we have mentioned some wonderful colors and we have used the word economy to go with it, blue and green economy. Both economies are very extensive, but today we will zone in on some low-hanging fruits as far as business opportunities are concerned. And uh, as we have mentioned before, tourism is definitely one that we will be looking at as a potential market source. And the supply side, we'll be looking at agriculture. So I have a little story to tell before I start. So after being fed a healthy diet of information on these two economies, I started to look at looking at the information from the perspective of business development and entrepreneurship. And I want to be able to infuse my colloquial language if so allowed, so that I don't use too much tush, tush, tush talking and bite up, bite up my lip. Right? So in my telling of the story, I might have to lean a little bit on the um, patois. So when I read the material, I looked at what is the most important thing required to have a good business idea, something that's viable. And I looked at the, th the thought that it has to be solving a problem. And so if it has to be solving a problem, let me look at the subject matter from that perspective. I then asked myself, and I'm going to ask you the question, what can you ingest into your system as a human being that did not originate from agriculture? Anybody have any? Suggestions? So if everything that we need to sustain life originates in the realm of agriculture, we have a situation. And then the next question is, what would happen if all the farmers and the persons involved in producing these items decided that agriculture was not a viable business opportunity for them? and just decided not to go into agriculture. What would happen if all the entrepreneurs who are currently in agriculture and the 250 students now at the College of Agricultural Sciences decided that agriculture was a no-no? What would happen to us? So, Houston, we have a problem. First ingredient for business. Then, 
I started to look at how, why would we want to solve this problem from an entrepreneur's standpoint? Because yes, food, security, and all those things are social issues, but how can we also look at it from the dynamics of wealth creation, right? And so if we have the problem and we have the space to now explore possible solutions, then certainly there must be business opportunities that exist, right? And so, firstly, I would like to announce that agriculture is sexy. Agriculture is a critical thing to have a discussion on, and agriculture must be sustained for life, right? And so, on that premise, I want us to listen and engage in the conversation. It is really an exploration of how we can capture wealth and still solve the, the solutions that are required. What are some of the questions and concerns you have? What are some of the things that hinder you from delving into this sector as a business opportunity? And they have the experts here. And one of the things JBDC loves is the fact that we have so many friends that have a wealth of knowledge that can share with our clients and share with our audience so that we can generate economic growth for the country. All right, um, thank you for having me. Um, why am I here? Well, I am now the president of KISS, primarily teaches agriculture and practices agriculture. Uh, we produce about 250 graduates annually in agriculture. But our total population of agriculture students is about 600. So we have quite a bit of persons that are actually studying agriculture. In fact, we have seen a, about a 40% increase over the past um, four years. Okay. So there's a, there's a strong interest among the young people to get into agriculture. Um, but I've also chaired the, the Agriculture Tourism Linkage Subcommittee from inception, which has spanned two administrations. Um, and uh, I've been on the Linkage Council from, again, from inception. We have done a lot of work in terms of understanding the demand in the sector. I first did a study in 2008, where we estimated, at the time we, we estimated about, um, for fresh vegetables, about 200 million US dollars. The, the study, the, the first study we did was in 2015, but at a gestation about two or three years before that, but it was published in 2015. In that study, we estimated, essentially, the demand for, for agriculture produce at roughly 38, 40, 40 billion Jamaican dollars. It doesn't restrict much from there. Uh, so you're really looking at a sector that needs 40 billion dollars worth of agriculture produce for its survival. Here's the challenge that we face. One, our tourism numbers are growing. We know of approximately 35,000 30, 35, hotel rooms. 15,000 rooms are planned in the next two to three years. We have an import bill of, well, it was a, a billion, came down to about 700 billion. It's now up to 800 million US dollars. And the challenge that we're seeing now is that with the increase in hotel rooms coming on board, as of right now, I'm not, I've not seen a plan in terms of how we ad will address that, that, that issue. So, but there are two large farms that, that are emerging um, that we think will help to plug some of those gaps. One in Bernard Lodge, one in Innswood. The one in Innswood is interesting because it is actually being run by a number of Israeli, by Israelis. And uh, if you follow agriculture globally, you realize that Israel is one of the most efficient and productive countries where agriculture is concerned. Now, um, there are many areas of demand in the sector. And uh, so I could spend the entire night telling you about everything, but we try to identify what we call, regard as the core. And, it, and it, the board actually gives you the, the key ones. The critical issue we find sometimes, though, is that even though the demand is there, our farmers sometimes don't recognize that an importer can import. And an importer is under no obligation to import less and buy local. Because fundamentally, 
it's about making money. And if I import um, from North America, I can land produce. Let me give an example, fish. I can land fish in, in Jamaica at 60% less than what I can buy it from a local fish farm. Strawberries, the, the, one of the few competitive crops we are seeing, which is, which is very interesting, is actually strawberries. So typically, if you were to import strawberries, because strawberries have very small, a very um, short shelf life, no more than about two or three days. When it gets to Jamaica, within two or three days, if you don't get to the hotel, it is gone. So the average price for imported strawberries is about $1,000 a pound. But for Jamaicans who are able to produce strawberries, you have that seven-day window to play with. We're seeing Jamaicans able to produce at about $400 a pound. And so they, they, they can sell anywhere between $400 and $1,000. Right? And typically, the Jamaicans are selling strawberries at between $700 and $800 a pound. It's one of the very few crops where we're actually very competitive with imports. And it's primarily because of the, the storage, the shelf life issue. But everything else, we are simply not competitive. And the, it, it's, it is a concern. So even as we, we talk to entrepreneurs, we have to start to think in terms of getting people to start to look at technologies that can improve their efficiency levels. Because while we can restrict some things, and, and I certainly, in, in my decade of working with the Ministry of Agriculture, we have restricted a lot of products quietly, which is illegal, by the way, under our WTO regulations. It's not legal. I probably shouldn't be saying this publicly, but um, anyway. <laughs> yes. but, but we have, I won't tell you what we were doing, but we, we used to restrict and threaten and, and coerce and whatever else we needed to do to convince the importers to buy local, even though it was not necessarily in their best interest to do so. But the thing about it is that we're saying, OK, well, if you don't buy local, you can't get a permit, so make up your mind what you want to do. <laughs> now, the, these are kind of strong arm tactics to try to jumpstart the process, right? <laughs> Some people call it that. <laughs> in fact, at one point, they, we got a call from, from the US um, trade attache from Domrep, who was ranting and raving, and needed to see the minister because what we're doing is illegal, blah, blah, whatever. Anyway, we told her that the exact words were, what we are doing in Jamaica won't affect the price of tea in, in China. Right. And that um, our imports from, from the U.S. is minuscule. And, it's a, it, and compared to the global market, I mean, we are, we are not even a drop in the ocean. So she came and, you know, we were able to kind of pacify her by showing her the numbers and say, we're not important to you in, in that context. But I thought that, but that, that, that works only for a time and no more. We create a window for farmers to establish themselves. And interestingly, an avenue would, would have been a part of that story. We were able to move from 25% of, um, of local demand that we were producing locally to 85. So if you look at the board, for example, you see a, a figure of 572,000 US dollars of imports of table potatoes to Jamaica. The figure was four million um, in 2008. So we have significantly reduced that importation. And, and the farmers have maintained and continued that, 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 that practice. So we're actually seeing a lot more production of potatoes that, that, that come into the market from local sources. So we know it can be done. Once you give the farmer the opportunity and you identify all the pieces. But what, one of the things that we did, which I, I, I was referring to in an earlier conversation, one, we identified the market. So we locked down the market essentially, by extortion or means, if you want to put it that way, but we're not on the market. We force the two parties to come to a price. Again, them things are not quite legal, but there's a price that, we, that the, the farmers and the, the, and the buyers agree to, which in 2009 was $40 a pound at market. So you know, we set the price at farm gate. And then we basically, we had, interestingly, we had four trucks at the ministry of agriculture that we were writing down. And we got some funding from USAID for um, Tropical Storm. Can't remember any of now. Anyway, Gustav. we took the money, good staff. So we took the money and, and we fixed up the trucks. And we, we created a, a, a logistics system. We created two centers, one in, in, in Geisel, one in, in Manchester, Coleville. And we, we put, so the Geisel is an earlier production parish. St. Catherine, Monique, will plant potatoes, usually start planting in October. 
Manchester, which is the largest produce, production parish for potatoes, starts producing, starts planting in, in February. So you, you get Manchester late March, April, May. You get Geisel, you know, sent on earlier. So we used to store the potatoes in Geisel, then, well, put it in Geisel, truck it to Manchester. And then we arrange a sale between the, the, the buyers and, and, and the storage center. And we charge five dollars per pound. So we're not, it's not, it's not um, charity. As we told the buyers, you have to pay for the service. In fact, one of the concerns the minister had was that we were making too much money on the service. That's, <laughs> and that's, the minister's not supposed to be making profit. But anyway, that's aside. The, the, the point is that it worked. Um, so we know that if you create the right environment for the Jamaican entrepreneur, they will deliver. The challenge though is that you don't have the same kind of um, willpower and the same set of circumstances that allow us to do the same thing for other crops. We started working with, with onions, and that is progressing, I'll, I'll just slowly, not as fast as we like, but the difference, again, is that the, there is a difference in the technical knowledge that farmers know to grow potatoes versus onions. Put another way. As I can tell you, put, Christian Potato Growers was growing potatoes from 1940-something, so we had knowledge about growing potatoes. Onions, we fell off. So for a long time, we were importing 98%, 95% of our onion needs. So it took a while to build the technical skill set among farmers to grow onions at a level that, 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 that can be competitive. We are now tackling two particular crops of interest there, strawberries and pineapples. For pineapples, we don't import fresh pineapples. Um, but the market for fresh pineapples is not well served. Because pineapple is a, has two distinct seasons, usually December to February, and, and usually from April to August. So in those other months, those other six months, there's no pineapple available. The only major supplier is JP, now joined by Case. I must say, Alvin, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we get that one. But we also have farmers that are using other varieties. So it's also a varietal issue. One of the things that we have been doing, certainly working with the ministry, is to introduce new varieties that are more efficient. So to give an example, with pineapples, we have cowboy, we have sugar loaf. without getting myself into trouble. I think Cobra is dead. You need to just put the museum and put it somewhere, because it's not a particularly viable crop. Um, one, it has a lot, the, the, the plants, big plants, small pineapples, uh, very sour, generally speaking, hardly ever eat a sweet one. And you, you, the productivity is very low. So you put, on, the, on that one acre, you can only know about 8,000 plants. Sugarloaf is not much better. But sugar loaf is bigger, so you, 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 it, it, it's not bad, and it, it, has, it's, it is sweet, generally. We introduced a new variety called MD2, out of Costa Rica. And that variety is what is globally traded around the world. That variety allows us to plant 25,000 plants per acre. So you can see the difference in the productivity changes. And it's consistent, it is sweet, it's less acidic to the stomach. So all the people who have acid reflux, whatever it is, it's easier for you to consume it. And, and it's also easier to, 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 to process as a process crop. So right now, we import o over 350 million Jamaican dollars worth of pineapple puree. We don't import table. We import some frozen products. But most of the table pineapples are grown locally. So pineapple for me is a massive opportunity for Jamaican entrepreneurs to get into. Suckers are not cheap, by the way. Normally, we import the suckers out of Costa Rica. And if you buy it competitively, it's $100 a sucker. We have been doing a service to Farada. And so we, we brought in a container, bringing in two on Friday, one on Monday, one next week Friday. And we are basically selling Rada at cost, which is $40 per sucker, which because we cut out, we, we don't pay custom duties, and we you know, do a number of things to, to facilitate the process. And we are trying to expand the, the production of pineapples so we can close those gaps that are available. But the issue of puree is a major one because we don't have the, the capacity to process pineapples. We have very few companies in Jamaica. So here's an opportunity actually to actually process pineapples and to offer puree because I can tell you the demand is massive. Right? And, and because we are using the variety that Costa Rica is using, we are able to compete, I think, with Costa Rica with a little, a little more changes in our technical program, we can actually compete with Costa Rica. 
So the, the, the potential opportunity for us to produce puree is, is front and center. Strawberry is another very interesting one. Um, at the ministry, at the, under the linkage program, we have basically taken on strawberry as a, a, a target crop. Now, interestingly, we are at the Ministry of, of, of Tourism, not agriculture. And sometimes this creates a little tension because I'm saying, oh, you're you know, you stepping on the agriculture area. But the fact is that I straddle both. So I, I usually just go ahead and do what I need to do. With strawberries, we, I, we, we import 140,000 kgs. Now, the reason why it's 140 kgs is because it's 1,000 dollars a pound. Very few hotels can afford that. So we think that if you're able to produce it at a cheaper rate, which we can do, we can, in fact, reduce the, the price to the market and increase the demand. Now, we produce 6% of our strawberry needs. So again, the opportunities are there. Um, over the last year, we have given from tourism nine greenhouses to farmers because we're recognizing now that open fields, pineapple, strawberries can be a little tricky sometimes because of the weather changes and because of the climate effects that we see now. So we, we you actually need to look at a, a, a market for covering these things. But again, we are way behind the hit ball. Um, and because we're presumptuous, we have joined the North American Strawberries Association. <laughs> so we get all the technical data, all the info, all the new varieties. In fact, um, we have an agreement with the University of Florida to bring in two, two or three new varieties that are, that are that, I mean, they are like this big. And they, are very, and they are very red and very tasty. The challenge that we have faced, though, is, is one of the cultural challenges that we have with Jamaicans, that they don't like to pay for planting material. And, and strawberries, like sweet potato, is one of those things that if you plant it, it, it starts running, you can take the data plants and whatever. But in, in the international space, when you pay, you pay in royalty, you have to pay for that. Whatever you, the runners are, you pay for that. And the farmers are not willing to do that. So we are a little weary about, actually, Portable plant material because we, you know, we'd, we'd have to pay for all that royalty. But here's an opportunity, I think, for us to actually, if we can identify entrepreneurs who understand what intellectual property is about, I don't want to pay the royalty. We, 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 it's something that we can, we, can, we can look at. But strawberries is one of those things that is just, is just sitting there like a duck. Technical skill sets can be acquired easily. Um, there are persons who are learning who can actually help to, to build out the space. And, and it, it's an opportunity for, for, for companies to make money. So, so those are some of the critical ones that, that I see. In, ter in terms of cha other challenges, one is storage. Jamaica, does, Jamaica is not really ready for modern agriculture, if I, if I may be very blunt. Because we just produce and sell. We just dig it out of the ground today and tomorrow reach the market. Nonsense. Don't make no sense. Because when, when you do that, you're losing value. And so... When there's a glut, everybody get to the market at the same time, and the price drops. So you can, you can, you can be growing sweet potatoes. And because, of the, because everybody gets into the market, you dig up yours and carry the market. Your price drops to $10 a pound. Remember, you know, your production is about $25, so you're going to lose money. Now, if you harvest potatoes, Irish potatoes, sweet potatoes, onions, you can, you can cure that potato over a nine-day period, usually 85 degrees Humidity, 85 degrees temperature. You can actually cure that potato and store it for one year or more. Jamaica not really in them kind of space. We don't do so on. So that's a major opportunity, I think, to look at building storage systems that can actually acquire those produce, store it, and then when there's a, a shortage, which in Jamaica, again, typical, glut, well, glut, price drop, shortage, and the glut don't last more than two weeks. Right? And interestingly, sometimes you have a glut in St. Elizabeth and a scarcity in St. James. It took me a while to wrap my head around that part. Because, okay, one hour journey, what is it? Do, do what? Do east or whatever it is. I want to go here. Right? From Mobile to, to St. Elizabeth. And yet, you can get a, a potato or tomatoes at $10 a pound in St. Elizabeth and $100 in, in St. James. Within a one, within a one hour journey from here, from here, less than 50 miles. So these are some of the challenges that we have to try to, to, to iron out. There's also the matter of logistics. Moving the, the produce to market. We tend to move the, the produce in, in, and I give an example of a, what an hotelier once said to me. Our farmers produce cabbage. cabbage. 
And by the way, cabbage is a very good success story. I, and I, you know, if you ask me later, I'll tell you why. But the farmers produce cabbage. And they transport it in the back of a pickup truck. In a plastic bag. The plastic, you know, the plastic feeding bags. And then they throw a tap oil over it. So by the time you reach the supermarket, 50% of it is gone. Right? It cook. So you have to strip. So when you, what is left is usually half of the value of the farmer. So a major problem in, in, in the sector is, is the, the losses, the post-harvest losses that, that you incur. Not what you, you know, you, you actually produce it well, you know. But by the time you get to the market, you have lost 40, 50, 60 percent. Lettuce is the same thing. Mostly greens. Color is the same thing. Um, Skelly is the same thing. But, but again, it's a, it's a challenge. Well, so there's some of the issues that, but there are opportunities because, for example, you can, if you're, if you're so inclined, look at the business of actually buying and selling. Nothing wrong with that because it's a critical part of the market. But actually having the right equipment to buy and sell. And increasingly what we're seeing now is that the hotels, I, I mean, I picked up this trend in, in probably 2006. I, I, was, I wrote a paper with Professor Denzel Williams um, looking at what some of the challenges facing tourism and why we, are, we don't seem to be getting it. I mean that we don't seem to be able to meet the needs of the sector. And the sector has grown past the farmers. So there was a time when the farmers were small and the hotels were small. 100 rooms, 150 rooms, one or two. Now, you're talking about mega systems. So there are three hotel chains in Jamaica that are over 3,000 rooms. They no longer buy a single hotel. They buy as a group, so they are system buying. So when you go to Sanders now, you have to supply to 11 hotels, not one. Because hotels are not necessarily willing to... Well, Sanders is a bit different, but like a real... They're not willing to buy, and they're not willing to build storage. So you buy and they store, and then they sell to their, they send to their own um, hotel, other hotels. They want you to deliver. If it's banana, you must deliver the banana two times a week to the six or seven hotels they have at this particular time, which is not easy to do. It requires some resources, but if you have money, it's something you can take on, right? Because they want it fresh. And they want it on time at a certain time, but they are not willing to invest in the storage. Right? Sanders is different because Sanders has formed a, a partnership with a, with a company where they, they, they help to build out the storage facility. So the gentleman goes around Jamaica and he buys up the stuff and he stores it and holds it. And when Sanders requires it, then he transports it to the hotel. So, the, so I mean, I, I just, hopefully I've just given you a few, a few things to actually think about. Okay. Thank you very much. Wow. So at this point in time, I just want to pause to welcome our three exhibitors that will be sharing with us in terms of, you know, just kind of showing us some of the value-added products that come out of agriculture. We have Nature's Cut, Bamboo Hut, and Eco Smart Sip. Those are three clients that are with us this afternoon exhibiting. So when we wrap up the discussion section, please you know, take a look at what they have to share with us. Now we'd like to move on to another section and we will take the questions after the panelists have presented. We'll move on to our next panelist, Miss Marilyn Headley, who is the CEO of Forestry Division and Conservator of Forests. And she will be speaking regarding the importance of tree planting to the green economy. As you say, we're here talking about tree planting, but I'm actually going to spread that and talk about trees and forests. So it's not just tree planting. First of all, we want to plant and establish those trees. So we don't want to just put them in the ground and then we walk off. So it's tree establishment and that will result in forests. And also important is that we do have a fair amount of forests in Jamaica. And how can you utilize that? You might have some forest that you don't even know because you're calling it bush. But one thing we don't have in Jamaica is bush. Every bush is a forest. And once you put the name forest to it, it increases the value from zero, which is bush, to forest, which you can utilize. You have forests, yes. Uh, when we finish, I will talk with you. We will explain to you what type of forest you have. So <laughs> it's very, very important because the whole discussion about green economy, the original green economy was the forest. Always there, 
was there has been replaced by a number of things. And now we're going back to that. So we're calling it green. So your question is now, how can we do a sustainable development while keeping our natural resources, for example, our forest resources? So Jamaica, as I told you, right now we're classified areas as far as about 40% of our land mass is classified as forests, different types of forests. The most critical, the most important one is what we call our closed broadleaf forest. You call it virgin forest, natural forest, primary forest, the forest that Columbus and his crew came when they buck up on us, saw that was most of it was there. You still have that forest in the cockpit country. You still have that forest in the Blue Mountain, Dolphin Head, Johnsville, Stephanie Johnsville, and areas like that. Now, that's important that we keep that, because that is what you can utilize without actually cutting the trees. So we have 40%, and that's about 440,000 hectares of forest cover that we have in Jamaica. And then you say, so I have some, as he mentioned, some forests on the land that he has. How do you utilize that? One of the most important and probably more critical areas is recreation, ecotourism. We talk about it a lot. You mentioned pineapple from Costa Rica, but Costa Rica has mastered the art of getting their tourists to come there to stay and look at their forests. Their ecotourism is of a high class. So if you have your land with all those trees on it, your question is, what can I do without, without having to cut? And a recreation facility is very important. You could be looking at day facilities where you just have like gazebos, the essentials of you know, bathrooms and places like that. Or you could be building cabins where persons can overnight. Or you just put trails in there and you have treks and hikes and persons want to go for well, healthy well-being. So we're all supposed to be exercising. Forest trek is every year in March, so please join up. Ask Susan if you don't know the details. So when you look at those opportunities, that's what you can be utilizing your forest as. Very, very important. Now when we start looking at trees and tree planting, and you start to say, yes, I have some land. None of Mr. Desland is major agricultural crops to do too well on it. It is mm. that piece of land up there at the back that is too high, too steep, look at it again. You can plant trees on that land, right? Depending on where you are in Jamaica, which trees you will plant. Let me go to the shortest one. If you are in upper east and west rural St. Andrew, Mandeville, Christiana, plant Christmas trees. The official name is Cupressus lusitanica. You see those very, very industrious men in December on Constant Spring Road selling Christmas trees. They don't have enough hand to sell Christmas trees. Who's selling Christmas trees in Portmore? Nobody. Who's selling Christmas trees out by Harborview? Nobody. We don't need to import Douglas firs or spruces from North America. Our Christmas tree is what we need to use. Your Christmas tree production is a three-year program. So you have a hectare, two and a half acres of land. You're planting some trees. You divide it up into three, plant the first third this year. Next year, plant another third. The other year, plant the last third. By the time you finish planting that last third, the first third is ready to cut. So you get like four or five foot Christmas trees. You then cut it, you bring it down to St. Andrew, into Kingston, or what the Pope and you sell it. The next, by that year now, in the next planting season, you plant but that one third of land. So that is going to work. So you get a sustainable supply of Christmas trees. It's a once a year market, but it's a very viable market. And persons always asking for Christmas trees. Or you could just put some of your Christmas trees into pots, and persons who live in apartments and those places, they like those potted plants. So if you start to look at it and say, there's something I can do on small acres of land, small business, look at it. But then if you have some more land and more time, so while you're doing all your medium-term and long-term agriculture, if you look at it for a longer term, and put in some cedar, some mahogany, and that will take a little longer, some blue maho. So you're looking at more than 25 years, maybe 30 years. But the older one of us and then a call of the body, just think back, what were you doing 20 years ago? If you had planted some trees, what would you be doing now? Cutting and selling. 
But you see, we think about it and say, that take too long. By the time you spin around 10 years gone, another mm -hmm. 10 years gone, and then you have another few, or a few years to look and start to cutting and selling trees. But because we always think very short term, you know, it's very difficult for us to invite. You, you remember when we were quarreling about the turn of this 21st century? That's what? 20 years ago. What would have been happening now if we had planted some trees then? So you see, that's important that we start to look ahead while we're doing everything else to actually put some in. And if your land is in an area that you're prone to flooding and erosion and stuff, you plant up your upper hillside, your steep hillside, you're going to reduce that flooding possibility. You're saving your topsoil, which is important for all your agricultural activities, and that's very, very important. If we move beyond that, if we keep our hillsides cover, we are creating more beaches. The sand doesn't get muddy and washed away. And then if we don't cut out our mangroves when we are building hotels, we have more beach. <laughs> But you have to look at everything when we're doing it. It has mm -hmm. to be so safe. It looks nice. And you bring in some sand from somewhere and you cut out the mangrove. I was at a hotel last year. We had retreat. And we're in the beach. Nice. And we saw these things coming up, you know, nice and walking with the sand. And we stop and we look. There are mangrove roots sprouting off. Because right in that area, we're not saying yes, must have been some mangrove before they built the hotel but the mangrove is still trying to come back. <laughs> you understand? So we need it, we need the beach, but you have to ensure that we don't destroy everything while we are doing it. So you have to look at it as a package, you know what I mean? What are we doing? What are we interested in? Where are we going? And along the way, while you are doing your short and medium term activity, the time is going to come when you will get your payback from having invested in a long term activity. We have one private planter out in the West who many years ago decided that he was going to be planting trees. And then he would tell me, I'm retiring. Made this trip to China. He just sold some trees, right? He's planting something else. He sold some more trees. And he has a farm. So he has his farm doing pineapples and everything else and coffee. And he has his forest area. So his area he uses for tourists to come and visit. So they're coming to, they see in the farm, they taste in the pineapple, then they move through the forest, and then they go and have lunch. And then he can use his trees for other activities. So it's very, very important. Furniture is another thing that we can utilize. A lot of persons are interested in nice wood furniture, but nobody's planting to actually get this nice wood furniture. So we end up with some furniture that's kind of soft, and you know, you know what we call bagasse and various other things and you wet them and they spoil. But somebody needs to start to look that somewhere down the line, those who are coming up now are going to have a house, you're going to need some furniture, so we need to plant some trees for furniture. Craft, very important. Because a lot of the time, even when we have our tree and we cut it and we're going to use what we want, we waste a good portion of the tree. We waste the branches. We waste all the pieces on the side. We waste what we call scantlings. When you cut it down or from a cylindrical shape to a rectangular shape, you're wasting all of that. All of that can be used for your craft industry. So we just want us to just stop and think about it. Everybody do have to plant trees, but if somebody's planting, the others can utilize it and say, this is what we can do in the long run. But I just want to give you some notice when you are buying or acquiring your wood, ensure it is from a legal source. <laughs> they did not cut it off our forest or your forest, so this person must be getting it from a legal source. Sawmillers ensure that when you are buying the lumber, the person who is cutting it actually have permission or have, have paid, have a permit, have a license to actually sell, acquire that lumber. And all the chainsaw operators, all your chainsaws that you use for commercial activity must be registered mm -hmm. with the forestry department. So there's just a few little things in between. But we stop and we look and we say, the construction industry, you know, pallets and scaffolding, the Caribbean pine, that is a quicker one. If in some areas your Caribbean pine will be ready in 18 years. 
it grows really fast in some of the areas. Yeah, you, 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 you can get it. It says 20, but you know, you have some areas that grows really fast. And that one is really good. You utilize that. So we have to import all of that, what we call the softwood lumber from the north. Right? We still import, we import a lot of wood, but there are some of them that we can do some substitutes. And it's because we have to just start thinking what it is I can replace. When we used to work at Jampa, we always had this import substitution category. <laughs> so we have to start to look. We're buying everything. We have foreign exchange now. Life is much easier than when we were at Jampro and people are trying to save and the difficulty getting foreign exchange. But we still have to look at the future. If we continue to be importing everything that we have, one little storm, one little war, one little thing, and we are out of it. So I think at some point in time, as Jamaicans, we need to start to look and say, what am I going to contribute to this long-term activity? What am I going to do? And then you look at it. All these issues with climate change. One of your major solutions is increased forest cover. We're replacing a lot of plastic. What are you going to replace them with? Has to be some product which is renewable. So you have a plantation. I don't know if we've reached there yet. I mean, many years we've been talking about actually getting in some pulp, utilizing the trees to make products. But we haven't gotten there yet. I know we're looking at no bamboo to do all of this, but we could still look ahead. If we are growing no fast-growing species, so you don't need the long 20-year, 30-year one. You have fast-growing species that they will just be growing, you cut them, make your products. Can we look at that as something that is easier for us to handle? Because at some point in time, if we're going along the route, which is good, of removing our plastic, we have to go back to the day when we're using products made from certain trees, and these trees are from plantations. We don't utilize our natural forest for cutting, harvesting, or anything like that. Your plantation forest is what you put in. So some of the areas that we have all that was sugarcane. I don't know what we do with the land right now. <laughs> nice flat land. It looks like a crime to plant some trees on it, but we could try it. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's easy to manage. You put in your trees, put in that 10 or so hectares. You have, and you don't need a lot of water because the thing with tree planting is we encourage you to plant during the rainy season. And this year we got a really good rainy season now. Mm -hmm. When the dry season comes in February, March, those seedlings are well established. And they will hang on until the rain comes again in May. And then you plant again. So you really don't have that. What you have to start looking at now, if you're into the business now and it's well short term like Christmas trees or long term with your timber, when you get into the end product, you have to do pay attention to the person who is going to be borrowing your product. So your security, you have to pay attention to that. Because even though we are out in the rural areas, you know, some person just think that, well, okay, this tree is ready, I am going to harvest it. It's not that agriculture that have that issue. So you have to really put that into place as part of your plan. Who, am I, who do I have out there? What am I going to be doing to look at to say, well, when it gets to that stage, I will still have that product. So we just have to pinpoint those little issues that you need to look at and then start to think about it. So I just want to really stir up your mind to start to think, what else can I do? The Prime Minister announced a national tree planting initiative where we're going to be aiming for all Jamaicans to be planting about 3 million trees in the next three years have actually started. You could be thinking small, like you take your 10 trees and you're planting in your community, or you could start thinking big. I have some land. What am I doing with it? Come and talk to us at the Forest Department. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll definitely be coming back to that discussion. But I have one question for you, Dr. Deslandis. Um, how, how, do you, how do you, as a farmer, get into the linkages network system? And, and I know that you will now have an online platform, the Alex program, and uh, there is a logistics framework behind that. So how, how do you get involved? What's the process? Well, you, you can... Alex is an online platform that I've been working with for, for um, a couple of years now. It, it's a partnership with RADA, and we, the linkage network funds it. 
uh, typically it's a, it, it provides a market for where buyers and sellers can come together. So if you want, if you're interested, you can call Alex and, and you can provide the information and they'll take it. And they'll pass up to us. And um, if something you're interested in, we can, we can help them. We usually can pass it on to RADA if we can help. Or we'll action it if we can provide that support. Garlic is a very interesting um, product. Uh, we import 100% garlic. Uh, we have been playing around with the, possibility, with the idea of growing garlic. In fact, um, one of the things that we're trying to do at Case, we're trying to bring a Canadian couple. The gentleman does 100, 400 acres of garlic every year. Uh, we're actually trying to figure a way to get he and his wife to Jamaica for two years. And uh, the plan is to, is, to, is to do a test plot of about 20 acres to see whether or not we can actually do it effectively. Because we've never really grown garlic on any. In fact, I've, I, I can't recall seeing much garlic being produced here. The, the, one of the biggest challenges with garlic, though, is that the Chinese produce garlic at such a low price that it's very difficult for anybody to compete with them. So, with, so it's something that we have to, we have to look at it with and, and, and determine if it is viable. Now we will move on to our accelerator, Mr. Yip. And he will be talking to us on emerging technologies in agriculture. He himself has been using um, technology to do his um, process. And so we'd love to share hear, hear his experience in this field. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Yan Q Yip. And I decided to go into agriculture full time. Now. Before I get into the emerging technologies, which I'm, a, I'm very sure you're all aware of, um, I had serious experiences as a child with the limitations of the environment. I remember going to the farm with my grandmother one day, and she was reaping a yam. And it was the first time I saw someone reaping a yam. I always ate the yam, I always saw them but I didn't witness. I've never witnessed it before that. So she dug and she dug and she dug. The yam broke off in the soil. Right? So I was there helping her. And it was against a stone. And it took the shape of the stone. So I was like, Mama, I wonder if I could grow a square yam. And she laughed. Little did I know that, fast forward, years later, I would have stumbled back on that same idea by going into business. I heard about the business model competition. I decided to enter. And while thinking about an idea with my friends and eating, we opened a box. I was eating. And guess what was inside? So the idea came back. And I started doing some research. And when I did the research, we did our interviews. And we found out that, hey, People have been doing yam production for years, and they are literally not making anything from it. So being a young creative mind, I'm also an artist, we looked into the possibility of finding al an alternative to this. And that led us to discovering many different aspects that we're developing in the agricultural field. I ended up meeting experts in the field like Mr. Murray. And uh, those experiences steered me to understanding that agriculture requires technology. So we stumbled across a name. A friend of mine said Sotir, which means savior. Well, the name existed, so I added a T. Tsunami, T. So <laughs> it means together saving our trees, air, rivers, earth. And we are agricultural innovators. Of course, it's a startup, which is why I entered the accelerator program here at JBDC. And thank you for inviting me to be here. Now, emerging technologies in agriculture. I devised a little acronym, PLANT. So follow me with the words now. So PLANT production, right? Now. With production, you have to start with planting material, right? Now, I'm focused, I'm a bit biased as it relates to the type of agriculture. I'm more focused on the plant-based agriculture. Now, with production, typically, or 
traditionally, it would have been a case where you needed seeds, which you would have gotten from the previous harvest, right? In the case of potatoes or yams, you'd have to cut the tubers or save the tubers for the next planting, right? Now, over the years, we have developed many alternatives, which includes, one, cloning. Cloning is, it covers a broad, you know, um, range of, of things. So, TC culture is one major aspect of cloning, where you create a nutrient-rich, sterile environment for plant material, which you have to clean before you place in there. Because the nutrient-rich environment will feed any form of microbe, right? And because of the, the high growth rate, or the fast growth rate of bacteria and fungus and other microbes, they will take over everything before that plant gets a chance you know, to start developing. So that's just one aspect. Now, you have things like mini chromosomal insertion. Now, what that is, is when you insert genetic material into an existing plant or seed, and then those, the genes or the information stored in that piece of chromosome will affect the entire seed. It will give it additional features. It will, in essence, give the plant an extra boost. It will make it more climate resistant, right? And it will increase its efficiency in growing and using up the nutrients. So that, I mean, some people have different ideas of um, that type of um, modification. It has its pros and it has its cons, right? Now, labor. So we just went through, through P, so right L, labor. Now, there's this term that is used. It's called pervasive automation. Digging, planting, plowing, those things are kind of outdated, really. Now, you have machines. Machines that even reap precision-based machines that reap fruits, delicate fruits. They pick the strawberries or they pick the grape, right? And those things are collected, they're sorted by machines, by grid, and they're placed uniformly, right? At an efficient rate as well, more efficient than we can. So we move on, go to assessment, right? So with all your inputs, all your labor, you'll need to assess the process. Now, that requires the plants to be monitored, which requires the irrigation system, which requires a nutrient system. Now, where we are now with the technological advancement, we can literally trace every single input and track how it affects the entire process of plant development, of you know, production, and we can literally alter the production rate of plants by putting in necessary nutrients. So a farmer might plant on an acre of land and get X amount, right? Whereas someone can use this, this room here and get X times 12, you know? The efficiency is there. We can actually assess all the aspects and increase our ability to control the conditions and produce optimally. Now we move on to N, which is networks. Now networks applies to different aspects. Networks can be taken literally. We can refer to the internet. Now, systems exist that use technology, GPS technology, right? We have machines that automatically prepare the land and they have been pre-programmed to do everything, right? Now, with those types of systems, we have literally cut out the need for so much manual labor. And networks also applies to the, to the logistics, to the, the value chain, right? Because it's kind of pointless to be producing and then end up losing, as was alluded to earlier, 50% of the cabbage during transport. Now, technology has allowed us to create systems 
Now, one example is um, there's a development. I don't remember which company. But what they have done, they have developed, they have extracted fats from plant matter, plant matter even waste, waste matter, right? And that fat is used as a coating. It's mixed with other things, natural, and it's used as a coating on produce, for example, tomatoes, right? Which, you know, they don't have a very long shelf life. So that fat coating prevents oxidization and it prevents the water loss, right? And it extends the shelf life. So that allows production and the time invested to not be wasted at the end of the value chain. Because if you're putting all this input and then there are leakages, it's just like a pipe. If you have a pipe system and there are so many leakages, your water bill will be high, right? And you would have not used up that water for productivity. Now, the last part, T, technology. Um, we're in the fourth industrial revolution, right? We're no longer looking to the future. We are the future. We're at the pinnacle of, you know, where the technology can go. I think any, any further beyond where we are with technology is going to be diminishing return, <laughs> right? As um, Will Smith and Elon Musk alluded to. Um, so... I'm looking into production of roots and tubers. That's the thing that we started out because of yams. So I have developed a system where we can grow yams outside of the soil vertically using a customized hydroponic system which we invented called the root tube hydroponic system. You'll see it soon. So um, vertical farming using minimum land space. For example, with my calculations, what we are doing, we can literally use 2%, 2% of the land area that would normally be used for traditional production to produce the same quantity, right? So you're talking about a hectare of land, which is basically a football field, and we are bringing that to a 100-meter lane, one 100-meter lane, right? We're doing the same production in one lane of a 100-meter track, which farmers would use an entire football field to produce, right? And that's being reasonable. You can go further. Now, when we talk about technology, we're not just talking about the physical systems. We're also talking about the process itself. Because we, ten we can invent infinitely. For every different type of plant or growth, you can invent something to, if, to, to create efficiency and to increase you know, the productivity. For example, China, um, they have this thing where they, 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 they put a mole around the fruit. So when the fruit grows to maturity, it has a baby's face or whichever shape you choose. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's just some fun way of doing agriculture, right? But um, with, with the efficiency increased through the process, for example, I, I'll give this one away. Um, one of my aims right now is to target the waste management system, National Salt Waste Management. And we have 60% of that um, waste that is collected being organic waste, right? From the kitchen, from markets, you know, we have so many fruit vendors right now on the street. If they're not giving it to their hogs, it goes in the dump. Right? Now, all of that is rich in organic matter. Organic matter which contains the micronutrients necessary for plant production. And of course, it can be used for so many things. Now people are using um, organic waste to make um, packaging material because there's a ban on plastic. So, technology applies to integrating all these different ideas. And what you'll understand about agriculture now is that agriculture has become like the meeting point for the technologies, the different technologies. So you're talking about information systems, logistics. You're talking about the physical setup, infrastructure, right? We're talking about artificial lighting. We're talking about controlling chemicals. And when I say chemical, everything is chemical now. You know? Most people cannot eat chemical with something poisonous. But when you, when you analyze, because I'm a biochemist by study, um, when you analyze you know, 
how things work, how systems work, and understand how chemicals, how different molecules contribute to the build up of, you know, for example, a fruit, and how the systems work, you will be able to control the system and optimize on your production. For example, um, when I was home one time, there were some guys, they were planting in an area of land, but the street light was there, and I said to them, those corn will not bear, or if they bear, it will be minimal, and it will not be optimal. And they didn't listen to me. <laughs> they planted, and long and short of it, they didn't get any produce. So they put in all that work, but the street light was there. So there was no time for the plant to go through the dark reaction, right? So you have to have a light reaction and a dark reaction. So in essence, emerging technologies in agriculture, uh, we are at the phase where we literally have no excuse as it relates to, to actually producing and feeding ourselves. We literally have no excuse. The technology is there. It is out. Most of these things, the patents have, have run off, so it's not like you are limited. You can just get some ideas that exist, have existed. I mean, vertical farming was conceived from the 1950s. Now it's an everyday thing. It is the thing, right? So, yeah, let's use the technology. <laughs> Thank you. I don't, I don't think when I announced at the beginning that agriculture was sexy, that I even realized just how sexy and intelligent it was. Um, so thank you for that, and I'm looking forward to some of the questions that will be coming after the presentation. <laughs>